when a young boy and a cruel coach collide. All that's left is a ghost with an interesting twist. And then we travel to Greece to take a look at a trio of friends out hiking up a mountain. When they stumble across a car perfectly balanced on a rocky outcropping. They can't figure out how this car got there without being seriously damaged. But what they really need to worry about is the monster watching them from the bushes. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys are having tons of fun doing whatever you're doing. We got a ton of stuff to cover today. So first off, running into Dead Rabbit Radio Command is one of our YouTube Thanksgiving live stream contributors. Everyone and get on your feet and give it up for SK. Woohoo, yeah, we <laughs> he's doing a little jig, dancing on in, moonwalking into Dead Rabbit Radio Command. SK made a very generous donation during the Thanksgiving live stream. That was a lot of fun. I'm glad you were able to be there. SK, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the show financially through the Patreon or the merch store or the occasional live stream, we only do a couple a year, or through the merch store, that's totally fine. It truly is. Just help spread the word about Dead Rabbit Radio. That helps out so, so much. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you know. Dead Rabbit Radio is your favorite paranormal show. SK, I'm going to go ahead and toss you the keys of the Jason Jalopy. We're going to leave behind Dead Rabbit Command. Drive us all the way out to a local pub. We pull up at this pub. I don't know the differences between a bar and a pub is. I know the differences between a hotel and a motel. But we walk into this pub. There's a bunch of dudes sitting there drinking. They're like, some of them are slumped over. Some of them are talking about their glory days. Four touchdowns in a single game. I was like, yeah, that's pretty impressive. We're walking through the bar. There's guys playing pool. Oh, dude, you thought that was a real pool table there. That's a pretty good sound effect, huh? I've been in a lot of pool halls. We're walking past the pool players. We see some guys playing darts. There's no sound effect for a dart. I guess the dartboard. He made a thousand points or whatever. We're walking past the dartboard guy, and you're like, Jason, what are we doing in this pub? We're walking past all the good stuff. We walk past the plate of chicken wings, hot wings, whatever they're called. Yummy, yummy. I grab one. <laughs> I grab one of those. I don't let you get a drink. I don't let you play any pool. But I'm like, yoinks! This one's just for me. I'm eating this hot wing. Dip it in someone else's ranch. I'm like, <laughs> they're eating a salad. They had a ranch salad. They're like, ah. We walk past all the fun stuff in the pub or the bar. I don't really know what the difference is. And we go into the back of this pub, and there's all of these barrels of alcohol. <laughs> Magically got teleported into the past. Woo! You didn't expect that. We're sitting in a place where... A brewery. That's the term. A brewery or a fermenting room. I live in Hood River, which is like the home of... We have like so many beer companies here. Breweries. We have Full Sail and Frame. And a couple other ones. But anyways... We're walking around and I'm looking at all these barrels. I'm showing like, here it is, ladies and gentlemen. You guys wanted a drink, but little did you know that beer and alcohol of all sorts may be possessed. It may have demons in it. I'm speaking super loud. The patients are like, what? People are putting their beard down and they're like, I don't mind being a raving alcoholic, but demonically possessed. I'm out of here, good sir. We clear out the bar. These beers might be uh, full of demons. They might be full of demonic, or at the very least, demonic influence. Maybe you don't drink one and instantly get possessed, but could you? This is a story I wanted to talk about in yesterday's episode when we were talking about, is music bad for you long-term? Is it possible to manipulate time? And what are the long-term effects of becoming a time leprechaun? That was yesterday's episode. There was one other thing that I wanted to talk about, but I ran out of time. I'm going to put it in this episode. And this this idea, I found this online, where is it possible that, and this is one of those things that's going to be less controversial than the music one, but 
Is it possible that drinking alcohol opens you up to demonic possession? And that's a really interesting one because I think alcohol is one of those things that we all know the pros and the cons of drinking. Unless you start drinking at age 12, by the time you're 16, which still is illegal in the United States, but I know in other countries they can drink at like 16 or 18 or whatever. By that time, you um, kind of know what you're getting into. You know that you'll get drunk, and then the next morning totally sucks. You'll have a hangover. You'll also know that you'll just be aware of living in a community that some guy you, see, you hear in the news or your parents are talking about it or, God forbid, it's one of your classmates gets killed by a drunk driver. By the time you're a teenager, you've heard that story at least once. You know that people drinking make terrible decisions. They can make terrible decisions. Sometimes they become violent themselves. People end up getting thrown in jail, maybe even prison for their drinking. They weren't thinking straight and they did something stupid. And I think it's unlike, you know, we're talking about music. Could that be harmful? And we don't know the full effects. Everyone knows that drinking can be bad for you, especially getting drunk can definitely be bad for you. But can it open you up to demonic possession? Because you may do things that would seem definitely illegal, right? Let's say that you're getting drunk and you start beating your wife. Or you're definitely getting drunk and your car is jumping a curb and you kill four people. That's more of like an accident, but it's a crime, right? You get manslaughter for that. And you think, is it possible that you're drinking alcohol and you're inviting a demonic entity into you because you start to do the demonic thing? You start to injure people you love or innocence around you. And this was interesting because, I mean, again, this one I go, yeah, that does kind of make sense. I could see this. And this is kind of the way it was laid out. They go, these are the different theories. They go, one, it drops your energy, right? Your your um, energy is kind of a wishy-washy word, but basically it lowers your vibes, which I guess is more wishy-washy, but... Basically, like, yeah, you have a vibrational energy, or our soul, basically. It lowers our soul down to such a base level. It basically dulls what's truly unique and human about us to such a level that it appears that you're engaging in demonic activity, but you're not actually being demonic. And that would be the case of getting... You would never raise your hand to your wife or your kids, but when you're drunk, you do. I mean, th- that would, I, th- I think, I think punching someone in your family, I don't know if <laughs> I beat my brothers up a lot, but you know what I mean? Like, I, it, it, it can feel demonic. You're going to feel evil, right? These people provide, these people depend on you, and now you're beating them up. It feels demonic. The other theories is that, yeah, it does lower your vibes, your, your natural vibration enough that something can move in. The other theory is more demonically oriented. It's not just that it lowers your vibes and you appear to do demonic things. You can lower your vibrational level enough that it actually does invite a demonic entity into you, into into your body. And the way I thought of it this way is let's say that we all have a natural innate defense. Like, our, as a human being our vibrational level is at a base level. And sometimes it could be higher and sometimes it could be a little bit lower depending on your mood and what's going on around you. But it's at a base level. And imagine that that is a house that is a $2 million house that oversees a lake. That's the baseline human experience. And it was built specifically for our soul. That's who we are. But when you drink, you lower that vibrational level. You're basically lowering the rent. You're pushing yourself past, well, I feel a little sad level of vibration, even deeper down to the point where now this beautiful mansion that sits on the lake, whatever, for whatever reason, the sale price has been chopped down to 50 grand. So something else can easily move in there. There's a lot of things in the universe that couldn't afford the $2 million asking price for that home but at that price uh, you know anyone's going to get in there because by drinking you you have actually lowered your vibrational level and it's not that it just mimics 
a demonic possession, there's actually now a demon inside of you. That's a really interesting theory. And again, at this point, people are talking about the term spirits. You know how the word spirit meant, um, well, obviously, you know what a spirit is. A ghost spirit is also a way to use to describe alcohol. And then you'll see this online a lot. The best source I found was there's a YouTube channel called The Open Resorcery, which took me a while to get the name. It's a pretty good name. The Open Resorcery, they did a video saying that al cool is Arabic, which means body-eating spirit. And I watched this video. Now, there are other sources online that says, no, that's not where alcohol comes from. It comes from coal, K-O-H-L, which is means like a powder, and it involves a purification process. But I've seen other stuff online that agreed with the Open Resorcery saying, no, this does mean... I, 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 it's possible that al cool means body eating spirit and the word alcohol came from somewhere else and they've combined. But there's this idea that, yes, Jason, of course, when you drink alcohol, it does something to you. It does lower your vibrational level. It's allowing these demons to come in. Or maybe you don't agree with that at all. But what I thought the most, this was the most interesting part of it. I could see that back and forth 100%. That it makes you do demonic things, but you're still human. You've just reduced your reasoning capability. Or I could see that a demon might take your body for a joyride for a couple hours. But I thought this was really interesting. Someone posted this online. I never thought about this before. And it was kind of like, what, what do you think is going to happen when you do this? It was the same thing when we were talking about listening to music all the time. You're like, Jason, quit bringing that up. You're still mad from yesterday's episode. We look back and we go, what did you think was going to happen when you were smoking tobacco? What did you think was going to happen when you're listening to this music 18 hours a day? This is another one of those moments. They go, think about what could you possibly think would happen? The way you make alcohol is you put yeast, specifically beer, I think, but you put yeast in a bottle and you let it reproduce and reproduce and reproduce, but you don't let it escape. You're putting this living organism in a bottle, shutting it tight, and letting it reproduce freely. Generation after generation after generation after generation grow old and die in this bottle. Billions upon billions of living organisms die in this process. And then you swallow them all. It's interesting to think about it. I mean, yeast isn't human, but it is alive. It's actually the most... There's yeast floating through... As I'm talking to you, yeast is flooding into my mouth, and as you're listening to it, yeast is flooding into your ears. There's just yeast everywhere. And you're basically trapping billions upon billions of life forms in a bottle killing them off just so you can drink it and make feel a little tips and what did you think was going to happen it's an interesting theory I, I, it's an interesting theory because there is to make alcohol i mean it, technically to, to make food things have to die but we don't require alcohol we do require a certain amount of vitamins and minerals and protein so we do kill animals and have farms and stuff like that we do not need alcohol you're killing things simply for the pleasure of being a little foggy. Feeling a little, sit down and watch a couple episodes of Frasier, kick back a couple beers. The, all those things died just for you to have an hour of enjoyment. The food you need to be alive. You know, Sure, you don't need the double Big Mac or whatever. We can argue that. But interesting, interesting stuff. Is it true? I mean, the yeast thing is true. <laughs> it actually does anything to you, but I do find it as a fascinating story. Of It may be one of those things that we go, yeah, what, what did you think was going to happen? But, you know, drinking has been around so long. I think we do know the long-term physical effects of it, but the spiritual effects, who knows? Hey, who knows? It may be nothing. It may be demonic. And again, I think in that case, we're talking about drinking to get drunk, not just like a couple beers after work. But even those couple beers after work, you are basically annihilating billions of <laughs> billions of life forms died to drink that beer. You go to the Christmas party, they're like, you want a drink? You're like, nope. You have a shirt that says not a yeast killer. <laughs> they're like, what? You have a shirt that says, I love yeast. And then a picture of a beer can with an X through it. They're like, what? 
what are you talking about? And then you play this podcast in full volume. You're like, cut the music. The music is going to melt. Melt your brains, guys. I listened to this podcast. He told me he can control. He called himself a time leprechaun. And at that point, they're already filling out your pink slip. They're like, oh, he's fired. No, 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 no. Music can rot your brain. This time leprechaun. <laughs> this time leprechaun told me that. Now let's listen to the story about beer. If you're wearing a shirt that says I love yeast. SK, let's go ahead and toss you the keys of the carpenter copter. I don't think we're going to get to the... Um, I'm going to have to choose one of the two stories to tell. We don't have enough time for both of them, I don't think. SK, I'm going to toss you the keys of the carpenter copter. Let's go ahead and leave behind this brewery. Because I don't want to rush through either one of them. Fly us all the way out to... Greece. And if I have enough time after this one, I'll do the second one too. We're headed out to Greece. Specifically, we're headed to Pendeli Mountain. Pendeli Mountain. I've also heard it called Mount Pendeli. But uh, we're headed out to Greece, the Pendeli Mountain. It's April 1977. We're about to meet this man. It's a trio of people, actually. We're going to introduce the man. We'll call him Lewis. We don't have their real names. They had abbreviations for their names. But we'll call the man Lewis. We're going to meet his wife, Monica, and their friend, Judy. And they're taking a trip up Pendeli Mountain, and apparently they're just going on this hiking excursion. I don't know if they're camping in the area. They came from Athens, which is relatively close, but this is an excursion for them. That's the word that was used, excursion. So, But they are up there for a few days. I don't know if you can actually camp on this mountain. Um, but anyways, they are hiking around Pendeli Mountain. And they go up to a certain point. They're high enough up where it's snowing, or it has snowed. It's in April. I don't know what the temperature is normally like in Greece. Isn't it super temperate? So they're Far enough up that it's snowy, and they're having a good time. I would hate you can. I would never walk in the snow for fun. I can't understand that someone would do that. But they're up in the mountain and they're walking around the snow, and Lewis is like, "Hey, honey, do you see that over there?" And he's kind of like pointing off into the distance. And Monica's like, "What? Yeah, I see it. What is that doing there?" And Judy's like, "What's going on?" And she goes, "What?" They're all kind of looking because off in the distance, they're in a remote area up on this mountain. They see a car. It's not driving down the road. It's just sitting there. But it's out on this, like, real remote place. It's off the road and it's sitting on top of these jagged rocks. And they're just from where they're at, they can kind of look at it. They can realize that, one, a car shouldn't be there. <laughs> and there's no reason why you would park your car over there, too. How did they get the car over there in the first place? There's not a nearby road. And even if there was, to drive over all of those rocks, those jagged rocks to get there, the car would be totally tore up. But from the distance that they're at, they can't see any damage at all. But what are you going to do? Right? <laughs> it's like, help, help, I'm having a heart attack. I drove off the road. Uh, they don't go to the car. They just see it. They think it's weird. They continue on their hike. But they're up there for a couple days. Like, again, I don't know if they're staying in the nearby city and then coming up each day to go hiking or if they're camping somewhere. But for the next couple days, when they're in that area of the mountain, they go, hey, let's go see if that car's still here. Because surely someone has shown up to have it towed yet. It is a car. It belongs to somebody. If this was an accident, if someone had hiked down the mountain, clearly they could have gotten a tow truck up here. <laughs> go back up there now, there's a tow truck on the rocks too. No one would leave their car up here. They walk back by the area. They see the car's there. They move on. Next day, they walk back by that area. Car's still there. They they check it out for a couple of days. And finally, Lewis is like, you know what, dude? Let's go see what's up with this car. <laughs> Let us go find out how this car got here. If anything is going on. Because what could possibly be going on? So they begin to make their way over. 
they get to the car, they're kind of walking around the rocks, the jagged rocks, and sure enough, there's not a single scratch on this car. The way that they described it is this car would have been really, really banged up if it had driven over here. There's not a single scratch on the car. But as they're walking around, they see in the snow these giant... I don't know if you'd want to classify them as footprints, but they're prints made by something with legs. I think would be the best way to put it, because... These things are oval. They're just big ovals. They're about 20 inches long. And the, the way they described it was that they were even in grouping. So it was basically like a stamp and then a stamp and then a stamp. It was almost, almost like if someone was hopping in the snow. They said they were even in grouping, which is what I think that means, is that if you were taking a step forward and a step back and you made an impression in the snow, and then you took a step forward with the opposite leg, you could see that the strides were the same length, left, right, left, right, left, right, through the snow. Which wouldn't be unusual, that's how most people walk. But what they were saying is the odd thing was is that even over parts where the ground was uneven, where a human would start making shorter steps or longer steps to overcome a piece of bramble, they said it was even the entire way. Even over tough terrain. They're looking at these footprints, or prints of things that had legs attached to them. Looking over at the car, they're looking around. Judy is doing a little investigating of her own, and she's just kind of walking around. She breaks away from Monica and Lewis, and she's still in the general area. But she's looking around, and she walks over to where there's some bushes. Lewis and Monica are checking out the scene, when all of a sudden they hear Judy scream. I'm going to do it quiet, because I know people (laughs) listen to this podcast while they're sleeping. Ah! She's screaming. Shrill scream pierces the mountain air. And Lewis and Monica run over there, and Judy's totally freaking out. And she goes, in the bushes, in the bushes, I saw something. There's something in the bushes. And they're like, well, what? What is it? She said it was a, she described it as a, quote, white creature. A horrendous white creature. Unquote. So I'm thinking like Yeti, right? I'm thinking like Bigfoot. This thing, I had to double check the measurements because these are all in meters. I had to convert it to American. She said that this creature was only two feet tall. It's kind of hard to be spooky when you're two feet tall, but two feet tall with an oval shape. The thing, (laughs) she freaked out because she saw a big egg. Two feet tall with an oval shape and huge glowing eyes. And Lewis is standing there, and Judy is standing behind him and Monica, and Lewis is thinking, I want to look around that bush. See what she saw. Because maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's a giant delicious egg. He's thinking about it, but then he sees the bush start to move. As if there truly is something hiding back there. And they leave the area. They actually leave the mountain. Their hiking trip is done for that day. They head on home. They go all the way back to Athens. But a a while after that, they don't give an exact time period, but after that, they head back to the town of Pindeli, which is at the base of Mount Pindeli or the Pindeli Mountain. They're in this town nearby... This time it's just Lewis and Monica. They're in the town of Pendeli, and they go to get in their car. Lewis gets in the car, Monica gets in the car, and Lewis puts the key in the ignition and begins shouting at the top of his lungs. And Monica's looking over, and she can see Lewis's entire body trembling as he's just screaming. She's looking around. She sees nothing. She sees no threat. 
She sees nothing bizarre in the area. She's just watching her husband tremble as he's just screaming out loud, as he's just screaming and shouting in this parked car. And then he can't even talk. He can't even tell her what happened. He's just so scared. His body is just shaking. And after a while, he's beginning to calm down. Beginning to regain his senses. Monica's like, what in the world just happened? And Lewis is trying to figure it out himself. He goes... I put the key in the ignition. And then I saw something just outside the car. I saw a black sphere. This big black sphere just spinning. Just spinning right outside of the car. And it was spinning so fast I couldn't make out any details. But it was just there. And even though he wasn't able to make out any details on the sphere itself, he gave two descriptions of, like, the outline of the sphere as it's spinning, this big black sphere spinning around. Both of these are quite weird. Uh, One of them was, he said it looked like a sphere made up of thick black smoke. The other one was, he said that it appeared to be covered in hair. Like, both of these things at the same time. His mind's trying to process something that is incomprehensible. It's trying to put these pieces together. And that's the best he could come up with. It was hairy, or it was uh, entirely made of thick black smoke. But he goes, it was spinning, and then all of a sudden I felt something begin to crawl into my brain. I could feel an outside force slowly moving into my thoughts. I could feel it creeping in. And then that sphere touched the windshield and began to phase through it. It began to enter the car. And then it disappeared. It all disappeared. It could be a standalone encounter. I got this on thinkaboutitdocs.com. They got it from... uh, There's these very famous um, UFOologists in Greece. They got it from George Balanos and Thanos Vembos. I think we've covered stuff from Thanos Thanos before. Thanos Vembos and George Balanos. This was also one of the reports that was also in Albert Rosales' Humanoid Guide. A lot of stuff that comes from thinkaboutitdocs.com. Also has been researched by Albert as well, leading a humanoid specific UFO encounters. What's interesting, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we can talk about the story itself. Let me give you a little bit more background information. The Pendeli Mountain is known throughout the area as being a hub of paranormal activity. Like this is an area, this would be considered on par with say Mount Shasta in California which has a ton of UFO activity. It's one of those places that the locals know is just a weird place to be. There's also reportedly... I mean, it's one thing to say there might be... See, the thing with Mount Shasta in California, it's not just like, oh, there's might be Bigfoot out there. That supposedly has an underground UFO base or access to inner Earth. Like that level of stuff. It's not like, oh yeah, maybe you'll see Bigfoot up there. Mount Shasta, Mount Adams over in Washington as well is a hub for this type of stuff where it's not just that you might see something weird. It's that this place holds special interest for UFOs, for aliens, for just paranormal phenomenon in general. Specifically, it would be a heavy trafficked route. It's a heavily trafficked route. It's more than just you might see something there. There's whole communes based around Mount Shasta and Mount Adams to investigate this type of stuff. Pendeli Mountain, they also say there's a ton of stuff there. There's a lot of gravitational um, 
fluctuations in the area. It's like that level of power pull. Something's definitely affecting that region. Reports of UFOs, reports of odd creatures. It's Greece, but there's a U.S. military base in the mountain. There's a U.S. military base inside this mountain. Supposedly, it's no longer operational. It's been referred to, because there actually was a U.S. operation there, a U.S. base there. They've never disclosed what it was. People have said that they thought nuke, nukes were being held in there, which probably not a good idea to shoot a nuke out of a mountain, because if you miss, you know, you're inside the mountain. I guess people who launch nuclear missiles aren't worried about missing, but... People have said it's a nuke, nuclear research station. And people say they were hiding nukes in there for the Cold War. Other people say it was a U.S. listening post slash radar installation. Which I, I don't know how you would have a radar in a cave system. Because that was the idea. was the, the U.S. base was actually not visible. But there were U.S. operations in the area. We do know they had something in there. And of course, the conspiracy theorists say they were there to steady what was in Pendeli Mountain, what was causing these gravitational fluctuations, what was bringing UFO activity to this area. I also thought it was interesting, as I, as I was looking up the history of the mountain, I didn't know this. Here's a little fact for you guys. Remember the Philadelphia experiment, the idea that they had that battleship that u.s had that battleship and they tried running that cloaking technology to make this this is very well established paranormal slash conspiracy theory story that's why i've never really talked about it on the show i don't think but philadelphia experiment we were working on cloaking technology this is the story goes and they took this battleship they went to cloak it and it actually went through time or went to another dimension for a few seconds and like when it came back people were fused to the deck I think we did cover the story about the guy who apparently he says he was on the Philadelphia, that boat during the Philadelphia experiment. He jumped off as the ship was phasing out of reality and he like ended up through time or something like that. I don't know. I'll see if I can find that episode. What's interesting is when I was looking this up, that ship was real. Whether or not we ever ran the cloaking experiment and went to another dimension for a few moments and came back. I mean, that is the conspiratorial lore that was a real battleship. I don't remember the name of it off. I'm sure a lot of you guys do. I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but I do know this when I was looking this up. They then sold that battleship to the Greek Navy. And the Greek, the Greek Navy was like, hey, isn't this the ship that went into the future? <laughs> Apparently there was a Greek officer who came back to the United States at some point. He goes, hey, that's that boat you used in the Philadelphia experiment. And the government's like, what are you talking about? He's like, no, no, that boat we just got for our Navy, we bought from you. I'll put the article in the show notes. Um, but anyways, he's like, hey, that's that boat that went through time, right? And they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. They're getting ready. They're getting really mad. Probably getting ready to shoot this guy. He's like, I know what boat we bought, you morons. We bought the boat that you used in the Philadelphia experiment, because even in the conspiratorial lore, it did come back. But anyway, so you have an area that does have UFO activity, does have a U.S. presence there. What they were doing there, nobody knows for sure. And they were there for quite a while. It wasn't just like a weekend excursion. A couple of troops walking around the mountains. Interestingly enough, and I'm sure this could play into the conspiratorial lore as well, this mountain is where they got the marble to build the Greek Parthenon and all of these great buildings we see from ancient Greece, they got their marble from this mountain. So that's a whole other thing, right? You're pulling out all of this stuff out of the earth to build your great works, you build your homes to your gods. And yeah, marble is really cool to look at. It's a great mineral to use. But was there another reason? Were they seeing UFO activity at this mountain even back then? So it wasn't just that they were pulling the marble out of that mountain because it had a bunch of marble in it. Were they pulling it out because it was sacred to come out of that mountain? These are all really interesting questions to ask. But we'll wrap it up like this. We'll save the coach and the kid story for tomorrow's episode. We'll wrap it up like this. When I was reading this story, we still have the original question of that car on the rocks. And... There's a couple different things it could be. We've covered stories before where aliens will hide their form not very well, but they try to mimic a terrestrial setting. We had a story recently 
about a man and a woman who are driving down the road and they saw a very queer looking gas station. And when they pulled over, um, like this giant gas station attendant came out. He was this giant guy and everyone, they thought stuff was really weird. And then they lost time. The idea was that they got abducted and they knew everything looked weird about this gas station. And they had passed the sign. They're like the it was just this bizarre story. I'll put it in the show notes. And the idea was is that the alien mimicked a gas station but did it poorly. But it was enough to get them to pull over. We covered a story a long time ago. It's a lost episode. No one can tell me exactly what episode it was in. A lot of people want to know what number this was. Um, I don't remember what episode this was, but it was about a man and a woman driving through an area at night and they see a bunch of emergency vehicles on the side of the road and they see a car crash in the road and as they're driving they start to slow down for the crash and the next thing they know a gray alien is opening their doors on both sides passenger and driver's side and then i think after that they remember just driving down the road and again the idea was is that they this alien encounter they mimicked a car accident to get you to slow down And then pull you out of the vehicle. It's super creepy, right? Super terrifying. Most alien abductions will happen while you're in your home, while you're sleeping. It'd be much trickier abducting someone out of a moving vehicle. They can do it, but a lot of times we assume they abduct the whole vehicle. But if you can get them to slow down, pull over. Or in this case, you see a car out here in the middle of nowhere that could be whatever this force was whatever this phenomenon was was putting a car there and it could be thinking well humans like cars they'll come over to this car but it didn't realize that if i put the car out in the middle of nowhere on top of all of these rocks it's puzzling people may come over and they may not it's so weird what's it doing out there it could have been some other phenomenon that was trying to mimic something of interest to a human but was doing it wrong or and this is what I thought. I've read this story. It's creepy. That car may have been up on that rock. Because the previous occupant saw something up in that mountain. Whatever it was and left. Now he's back in the town of Pendeli, and he's in his car, and he sees something outside. He sees a black spinning orb He watches it slowly coming through the window as he feels an alien intelligence burrow into his mind. But this time the orb doesn't stop. This man doesn't snap out of it. The orb fully enters the car. The thing crawling through his consciousness completely takes control. And whatever it is, takes him and his car up Pendeli Mountain. It only needs the man. It discards the car like it's simply trash. Leaving it out at a random location, just like we would throw a candy wrapper on the ground. And that's why that car was up there, and it's such a bizarre place. An inaccessible place. And that car belonged to a man who wasn't able to escape the force that was trying to control Lewis. This man succumbed to this alien intelligence and was never seen again. Now that all remains of this man is a car somewhere up in the mountains. A solitary, silent testament to the true power of the aliens inside the mountain.
deadrabbitradio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. TikTok is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day. I'm glad you listened to it today. 